die in a ditch on my knees begging that somebody won't put a bullet in the back of my head. I do not plan on giving that legacy and leaving that to my children. And none of you should accept that either. Together, we must travel into the future with all of our people intact, with all of our freedoms intact. Without that, without our Constitution, without our Bill of Rights, we're in a pretty sorry position as far as what we are going to hand down to the next generation. God bless the United States. Death to the new world order. The Republic shall prevail. Goodbye.
They are, they say, one word can say a, a, a million with the way it's phrased and how it's guttural, how it comes up the year. In talking with people that I've seen their outer party members, when the farmer is mentioned, they almost salivate. The other thing, the Constitution. With a hatred, they will mention the Constitution. Not, any, not with any reverence, not with a, not as a, a document of the people, but as something that has to be overcome. The enemy that we face has a mission. It is in some way to undermine the Constitution of the Bill of Rights. I handed a few of these out tonight, and there's a reason for that. Anytime you can get a pocket copy of the Constitution, cherish it. Hang on to it, and don't sit it down in your nightstand. Don't lay it on the shelf for it's like dust. Put it in your pocket. And when somebody says, well, all people don't know what they're talking about, be sensible enough to read this little booklet right here, which is your document. Yours, this, this, this creed, this is a demonstration of your inalienable rights right here. Almost all of what you need is in this book. Open it up and demonstrate to them that they're wrong. Now for a long time, especially with the assault you're going to hear in the next few weeks, you're going to hear all about why we need to get the guns. The most common attack now, since people are starting to wake up and realize we have to use the militia defense, is that the militia is not the general population, but was the National Guard or the active army. Pull out your little constitutional pamphlet here. Go to Article 2. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It is expressed straightforward as one of the first ten amendments to the Constitution, which means that these are inalienable rights that cannot be revoked. Unlike other amendments which were added, these are ordained by God. Now, they tried to take a 1993 dictionary and reinterpret the wording of this, this document. Rather than taking the original dictionaries and the words and the meanings thereof, and why fight them, let's go over to Article 5. This is what I use every time somebody tells me that something else is going on in the Constitution that I don't understand. If the militia is the active army, then riddle me this, Batman. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia. You see my point? The land and naval forces are our military or the militia. Now, Article 9 and 10 of this Constitution is very important because it explains one other point that most of them have tried to come up with when they try to subvert the Second Amendment. That has to do with the fact that in Article 9 and Article 10, it explains that anything not enumerated in this document is, a, is property of the people. The citizenry, as in the people, you, me, everybody else, an inalienable, an inalienable right that need not be written down. Now, we've eventually gotten into the interpretation of law through the courts, but these were never to be interpreted in any other way than the fact that as a citizen I could do this right here. Hold this document close to my heart, and I challenge you to take it from me. What has happened in this nation is that our politicians have learned not to fear us. Go to Lansing for one day. Just one day. I challenge you to step into those halls for one hour. We are the stooges. We are the stoops. We are the incompetents. We are the cannon fodder. You are treated as dirt to be swept back out of the building. Now, we've done a pretty good job of slowing them down, but they keep running coming. There's a reason. The enemy that we have is vastly arrayed. They're in all, they're in all aspects and all levels of government. There are many who are people who are perhaps ignorant of what they are doing to a limited extent, but all of them crave power. That is the key feature here. The beauty of our Constitution was to ensure that that would not happen. The many protect against those few who might have the capability to coerce us in some way with a mercenary force. The, the founding fathers, Henry Kissinger, at least gave a great praise to, but it was in a, in a derogatory way. He said, gentlemen, the founding fathers of the United States wrote this document too well. We will have to subvert it and go around it. 
That was Henry Kissinger in 1977. Remember, this is the man who worked for the State Department. Interesting thought, isn't it? He's one of the people who helped to uh, formulate the New States of America Constitution, a document that they will try and foist upon us to replace our Constitution. The New States of America Constitution has come close to brushing by our heads and enveloping us three or four times in the last six to eight months. Were it not for five or six people in this state alone, and it's key five people, we would be under the New States of America Constitution already, if they had their way. We don't have a lot, but the little we have, we sure as hell know how to use. And that's been our advantage so far. You'll notice that uh, somebody asked me, boy, Mark, are you gonna cheer me up there or send me back home with Will and Doom? Well, I'd rather not fight this, but <clears throat> you'll notice that I don't cry a whole lot here. Because I know that in the end we do win, and there's no doubt in my mind we will win this battle. We'll win the war. Right. That's right. In the meantime, as a friend of mine said last night, while what we have to do is learn to pray because it all depends upon God, right. but we act as if it all depended upon us. Because he expects that of us too. We do everything we can to find a peaceful way of solution to this. But I understand this with no illusion. The enemy will not suffer a peaceful solution. The game is all settled against us, not in favor of us. We must have a knowledge of how our government worked, not how it works now. We must understand our rights, our guidelines, and what it is that we need to restructure this government to put it back on track where it belongs. So I fully agree with all the other speakers that I've heard today, because we must be knowledgeable. How else can we take this country, turn it around, take control of it, and then stand there idly by and let them do it again? We cannot afford this. We must become knowledgeable citizens. We must become active citizens again. Take back City Hall, take back the Township Hall, take back the courts. The whole mechanism has to come back under our control, not as a fist, but laid in our hand. Not as a pet, not as slaves, but as free citizens with free will and capable of demonstrating our knowledge and our intelligence. And that's been the biggest problem. In the last several years, we've been fighting this for a long time, and I see a lot of guys who've gotten old doing it, per se, not that much older, it's just like yesterday. But we've all learned quite a few things, and I, I, I thank God I've had a chance to meet the people I have. This little piece right here, a lot of people have probably seen. It's George Washington's vision and prophecy for America. If you have not seen this, I highly recommend that you get it and read it. There are smaller copies of it, or simple versions of it that are available but I suggest that you read it. This used to be in the history books, by the way. This is in the Federal Register. In three different places, it's in the Federal Register of the United States prior to 1900. In fact, back during Washington's era, it was, was implemented in that way. What happened to this? Well, around the turn of the century, somebody else took over our education, mission, uh, our education system and the rest is history. Or shall I say they created a new education system whose mission it was to make sure that this was not taught to our children. Now, I've been going to school for, well, since I was six years old, about five years old. I'm still in a school environment. I had never seen this until about a year and a half ago. And even then, I only got a chance to glance it fleetingly and didn't get a chance to read it completely. I challenge everyone to read it. Mark's not going to read it for you. So if you see it on the tape here, or if you're listening to it now, I'll, let you, I'll, find, I'll inform you of where you can get a copy of it. But um, John Grady, M.D., OSJ, Route 2, Box 165, Benton, Tennessee, zip code 37307, small town. small town, 100 copies, 75 cents each. It's a booklet, there's some color print, there are simpler, cheaper copies out there. Mark doesn't want to read it to you because I want it to become a mystery. Now you're going to want to look at this thing, you want to find out what is in there. George Washington foresaw, as a man of vision, exactly what was going to happen in this nation. Two of his guesses, if you want to call them that, and I don't think they were, I think he prophesied properly and he was given a vision. Two of them were absolutely correct, and the third one is yet to come. We're in that time. We're living it now. Because of that, we have to remember other creatures. It's sad that I should offer you this great picture of this great man. 
And then off to use this picture next. <laughs> the butcher of Waco, Janet Reno, she only did it for the kids. All she wanted were the little girls. <laughs> Remember that. Wow. Okay. The butcher of Waco in here, this is Slime Magazine, a magazine, by the way, that is hurting because of the Patriot Movement. If you have a subscription, cancel it. If you have a neighbor who knows that he's getting a subscription, cancel his. <laughs> Give him a call, cancel his subscription. I'll tell you why I know they're hurting. Just give you a little update here on something you should watch. They just did one of these things with Time Magazine. They put Ronald Reagan on his head and they said the Reagan years, you know, turned upside down. Okay? This is supposed to be a para-prestigious magazine, or they assume to be. Okay? When you do something like that, that's a gimmick. That tells me if you're pulling gimmicks, you're trying to find ways to sell your rag. Let's put these people out of business. Okay? Best thing to do. So, get them in the pocketbook. Get them in the pocketbook. Doesn't cost us a whole lot, but will do a lot of damage. In here, they talk about Butch Reno, Butch Waco, that uh, she's the next best thing to slice right bread. Well, I'll tell you what. If anybody's been paying attention to what's happening in the last few days, we talked about this at the last meeting. Anybody who's heard me in the last few weeks, in the last, in the last few months, knows that we discussed what pre announcements we had heard concerning the reorganization of government. And what does that mean? Well, let's think about this. Just as we were discussing earlier, what we say and about you think are two different worlds, aren't they? What I say has one definition, and we know that what you think is another. Reorganization is entitled, you know, as in, as in Chapter 11 and Chapter 13 uh, with bankruptcy. Reorganization means somebody collects on the debt. Congratulations, they're going to come to the last part of your pocketbook. What that means is that the federal government, with its vast debt in place, is going to trade something to the International Monetary Fund, and there aren't a whole lot of departments left to trade. So the next thing is real estate. Reorganization means that the LESC will become more efficient. They'll be about as efficient as Stalin's KGB was in 1949. That's how they'll be more efficient. If everybody hasn't heard, and remember we've been talking about this for the last two years publicly, their mission behind all the fabrications, behind all the stories, behind all of these petty articles in here, was to convince the general population that we have to have the Velvet Glove and the Iron Fist. We must have a centralized national police force. Today they announced two days ago that they are going to bring to the reorganization a single entity made up of who? The FBI, the ATF, the DEA, and the Central Intelligence Agency. Kids take one hand and close the fingers. The most terrifying entity that I can think of is to take the butchers from the CIA, the incompetence of the ATF, the money mongers of the DEA, and throw them together with the FBI and create something the likes of which this planet's never seen short of the KGB or the Gestapo. The only thing closer might be the Inquisition, or it could at least be the, could be the Cheka, which of course, the Cheka just was re-employed by the NSKBD, which was communist Russia. Now, we've been talking about this for a long time. It's now coming to pass very, very quickly, and it's going to be geometric in nature. You're going to see everything double in effort, double in speed. So we will not have a whole lot of time to respond to it if you haven't already been working. What other mechanisms are they putting in place? Well, kids, do you have your papers? Uh, if you don't have your papers, that's right. If you don't have your papers with this new mechanism, we have, of course, a new medical program for you. Yes, this new medical program means that if you are 50 years old and you need uh, dialysis, we have a death warrant for you. They've already stated this last Wednesday, that the new health care program has a list of diseases the likes of which you will not repeat, will not be treated for. What that means is the death sentence, because there's another point to this, the other half of the coin. If you have the disease, you also can't go out and seek treatment. For me, if I were a doctor, to treat you under the table will be a felony. Comrade, you're living in the New World Order. This is socialism and communism. The part they don't tell you about, which is why Canadians come to the United States now, because their socialized medicine mechanism in Canada does not work. 
Now I'll challenge everybody to think and put this all together. How can you sell a crock of crap like communism, fascism, or socialism if you have a country like the United States sitting intact here? You can't. We are the last single and best stumbling block on the planet. We have always been alone. We will always be alone. Period. I've had people say this to me a hundred times, but Mark, there won't be anybody on our side. There never has been anybody on our side. We've paid most of our friends that we have overseas, and even the ones that say claim to be our friends are like, who, England? The people who first we had to break away from, then came back and invaded a second time, and have financed virtually every war we've been in, as far as trying to make money off us and pull the wealth out of the nation. Can we talk about Asia? Excuse me. Do we need I say more? Let's talk about Europe and Asia. Both of them are playing a tug of war right now to decide who's going to pick our bones. So what will this health care program do? Well, if you'll recall, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds, in their Council on Foreign Relations documents, stated last spring that they would like to see a population of 2.2 billion on this planet by the year 2008. Now, kids, we have 5 billion people on this planet. Half the population of the globe must die within how long? You're talking about a 15-year period. Do 2 billion people die of natural causes in a 15-year period? No, but we can help them along a little because they said they'd like to see this through war, pestilence, famine, disease, and any other contrivance they can come up with. Now remember, on the one hand, you're hearing classic Orwell, peace, peace in our time. War is peace. Ignorance is knowledge. Hate is love. Three comments. They all fit this time. I walked around last Friday, I was talking to somebody else in the lobby here too. I walked around this last Friday with a book, with the 1984, and I just went through it and just opened up the passages and I started reading it and I started looking and it's like you can walk to a bulletin board on campus and go, here it is. You can talk to these idiots that are coming into college right now and here you are. They've got the uniform, they have the speech, they have the mechanism, it is all in place to be used. But there are still too many of us out there right now that we are a great threat. You may have a lot of resources on the other side, the ones that are facing us, but you don't have enough to even come close to stopping us and wiping us out. Not even close. What I've seen in the last several months, in fact, just in the last two weeks, we've had a lot of fun. So many people so well prepared. You need to join their ranks, please do. But I have seen so many well-organized units that I am confident not only that we will win, but I pity the poor fools on the other side. If they wait two years, we would be in such a position that they wouldn't stand a dog's chance in hell. The military is waking up very quickly. It won't wake up fast enough, by the way. But it will wake up quickly, and we'll see a good portion of them on our side. As the sheep smell the blood of the sheep seven rows down who's in the slaughter chute who just had his throat slit, he may still get his handful of grain to keep him busy before he gets there, but he knows something's wrong. That's our situation with a lot of our common population right now who aren't sitting here. They all can feel it. They all know that the weather is electrified. They can all sense change. It is not a good change because nothing that they have come with publicly has in any way, shape, or form fit the words that they're using. NAFTA is another example. Notice that what they're doing is a classic, uh, it's like a keto. One, two, three, one, two, three, that's right. We hit you one, two, once, twice, and we go for a definite hurt kick or a hurt punch. We want to distract you by demonstrating a feint. I want to keep you busy over here. I want to keep you busy over here because I don't want you to think that this is coming. And that's what's happening right now in this whole situation. They've diverted, they're trying to divert us in many different ways. They are doing a good job. Until we focus and understand this is a coordinated effort, we will lose. Dramatically, the way I say lose is not that we will lose the war. But that will happen is we will lose a lot of people at the front. It's all a matter of what you're willing to pay. The better prepared we are, the lower the price. The longer we wait to prepare, 
the greater the price we pay to take back the piece of real estate that we stand on. Because it all comes back to land. Everything we need to discuss, the time that people have spent in jail for, the reason that we hold to the flag is over this piece of real estate. It's because on this piece of real estate we have the capability as free citizens to do whatever we want and I can tell you to go, excuse the term, piss up a roll. Because that's what we have to do. But until we learn to stand up again, people, and until we get a lot of other people with crowbars up underneath their hind ends and lift them up out of the seat, we're going to have a hard time dragging them all down the road. You know, the American Revolution only had a 3% participation rate as far as the actual combatants. The men who actually fought the war were a very small number, but they were a very proficient group. Took a lot of abuse, died of disease, lost families, homes, resources, fought with little or no weapons. That's why I fear not that, because we're in better shape than our counterparts of 1775. When they fought the war, as I'll remind you, there were no arms manufacturing in the United States, and there was only one powder plant. That powder plant was seized even before the revolution started by the British. The weapons that we had, we had in our hands. And I give you an idea, the enemy has understood this, and we talked about all these different things we could possess. In 1775, the citizenry possessed cannon, the martial heavy weapon of the day. You hear people like, well, you think people should have, when you listen to any gun people, they say, you think people should have grenades and machine guns? They don't know what to say when I say yes. Why do you have tanks? Yes. In fact, we have some. Do you want to see them? Oh! You think you should have nuclear devices? Only as many as the other side. Just like they do. Mutual assured destruction. The concept of that little document right here, and it was a very big one on the wall, is counterbalance, counterforce, balance of power between many different groups because they understood the aspirations of mankind. They understood how men could be corrupted. And because of that, as Kissinger said, they wrote this book too well. They will have to violate the law to destroy this document. Remember this, because it all falls in with Butch Reno character, with her activities, and with all these other individuals. It all comes down to them trying to use treaty because they can't get at us through this. They've stopped, you notice they've stopped trying to get amendments through because they're trying to push it through just amendments. Then they went for the Constitutional Convention Amendment because they felt they wanted to try and turn this thing on its head. Throw it up the window and give us a new, new document that is alien to our nature. It's alien to the whole concept of the United States. But in the meantime, always plans within plans, circles within circles, they envelop us with other projects. Through ignorance, we will not understand that treaty is not law in this country if it violates the first ten amendments. Treaty is illegal, is null and void, and you have an obligation, not simply a right, but an obligation to throw it from your presence, to drive it off into the ocean, send it back to the cesspool overseas where it came from. That's right. The warrior principle in this country, we are reluctant warriors, as a friend of mine said last night, and he's absolutely right. We are a nation of reluctant warriors. I will say that as best description to give. We aren't exactly enamored with the idea of going to war constantly, but I'll tell you what, just like I said earlier, God help you when you're in front of us if we do. They had to teach us to lose. That's what Korea was all about. They had to teach us to lose. That's what Vietnam was all about. And they gave us a third lesson, the Iraq war we lost. If you do not take the enemy and run your run your weapon through him, walk through his lunch, eat his eat his eat his sustenance, you haven't won. Saddam Hussein is still in power. All of the litmuses that we used to demonstrate victory on the battlefield, we had a conditional surrender, unheard of. The American government, notoriously, the American people notoriously are not satisfied with anything other than total victory, traditionally. But look at the last three wars. Since we've been involved in the United Nations, the people are, who are attempting to subvert this document again, we have been involved in nothing but entanglements and have been ensnared and had our wealth sucked from us. And again, boy, I've got to turn back to George here because he's the man who said that. Beware of foreign entanglements, for they shall, they shall ensnare you and sap you of your wealth. What have they done? Amen. This man, was, this man knew what he was talking about. I wish, of course, I don't think I'd be an old man now, wouldn't I? I wish I could, stood, I could have talked with him. I wish I could have stood by him. I hope to find men like that again. I know they're here in this country, and I know we're going to have to back them up, too. When the time comes, it's going to be a terrible fight. 
I've said this before. Not because I'm trying to be pressured, because I'm not ignorant and I'm certainly not a, a, a giddy-minded uh, warm-up. But in order to make good steel, you must have some pain. You must suffer the fire. And that's what we're going to face now. Not your children's lifetime, not your grandchildren's lifetime. I pity the people who say this time and again. I just want to retire and go off somewhere and I, I pray it doesn't happen in my lifetime. That is a terrible condemnation of your children's fate, isn't it? Sure is. If you are barely prepared to wage against this enemy, a war that is necessary, do you think that your children, being given the education already that they may have been given, will be better prepared than you to deal with the threat? I don't think so. Do you think your grandchildren will be better off considering the mechanism that they've established? Guaranteed they won't. By then, they won't even have any idea what the United States was about. There are many different threats, but the first is education. I, I want to stress this really, I, I want to stress it constantly. The enemy understood this because if you look at all the tentacles that he's reached in and, and driven as far into our souls as he possibly could, he had to take and get into the churches where the education is best. And then he had to create an education mechanism of his own, and that tentacle had run deep and grown roots everywhere because through that he could then push the churches aside. And that's exactly what they've done. This institution right here, I guarantee if you spent time in it, you wouldn't want to be here. You would, right? And because this college is no different from any of the others. It's affiliated in the same way. It receives grants in the same way. It receives privileges in the same way that the University of Michigan does, that Eastern Michigan does, that Western Michigan does, that Notre Dame does. And if you sat down and listened to what is going on in these classrooms, you would want to drive them from the room. And then teach the class yourself. Yes? You may or may not know that the University of Michigan funded the entire kidnapping and theft of Jennifer from Iowa. It was in the paper. Paid lawyers. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. You, yeah. Uh, in fact, the lawyers that were involved, we get a chance to see them on occasion as they pass through camp through the different campus areas. Um, the people that were involved in that particular situation with uh, the uh, adoption question, which was not an adoption question, but a parental right question, which is a, a key issue here in this country. All that has to do with separating the final link in family, children from parents. That's why you see this great contention. They sit down with what we call the spin doctors. Okay, they've got the Rand Foundation, you've got uh, the Carnegie Foundation, you've got all these different people. And the spin doctor's mission is to sit down, open a book, and go, well, let's see, we need this done. What worked back in 63? That didn't work, this did work, that didn't work. Keep this part of the program, modify this part of the program, and now we have better control over the media. We, we have the whole circus with the, with the media. We will generate what is needed, drive in and pluck that tendon and make that muscle move however we want. You see? And they've done that. As soon as they were done with the Michigan case, did you notice that we had a Florida case come up? Yeah. Then we had, a, we, had one in, uh, we had one in New Mexico, and then we had one back east. They bounced back and forth like this because we're all regionally controlled. And while they did a good job in our region, and they also controlled the other region where, where she came from, meanwhile, they were setting up the stage for yet another action. This is just like anything else. It is warfare. There are different stages to any war. These are preliminary actions that take place before invasion. Destruction of the family is key. It is instrumental. Drive that wedge in between the family and you destroy the last vestige of the Republic. Maintain control over the family, the family unit. You have the building block from which you can, you can expand and create the new Republic. Or reestablish the Republic we have. Yes? Either there's a wedge being driven in the state government or there's a power grab. Oh yes. What he's what he's just saying is that the uh, there's been a major power grab, or there, it appears that there's a major power grab. There is. Number one, you are noticing they're talking about efficiency in government. Now we just did a radio program last Friday uh, out of Connecticut, and I was uh, on the same program with Linda Thompson. While we were there, or while, I'm sorry, while we were while we were talking.
talking, one of the things that came up is the gentleman who runs the program was at a tax protesters meeting where the lieutenant governor of Connecticut was present. This man stood up in a room full of hundreds of people, and he was a complete moron, or somebody gave him notes for another meeting, and he stood up and he said, 169 cities and municipalities for the state of Connecticut are too much. You may have to change that. 50 states in the United States are perhaps too many states to manage. We will change that. And national sovereignty is perhaps best served through the United Nations. Amen. And is not so. Well, it was interesting. There were 10 people who I understand that jumped up. Fortunately, there were 11 mini cams running when he said this. This person is obviously an insider. The insiders have all had a lot of information telegraphed to them to believe that they can be this bold right now because and they're, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're having to move quickly. But the fact of the matter is they did not fear the people in that room at all. He espoused treason against the Constitution and the Bill of Rights right there in front of 100 witnesses with cameras running. Was there an objection? Oh yes, not very much so, but, and he, he, but they let him leave. And in fact, there was some quiet social debate afterwards. Everybody has been taught to be too polite. Yeah. I'll give you an example. The Reader's Digest did a piece here. I was just given to me last night. Please, Mr. President, tell the truth. First of all, don't say please. Mm -hmm. He works for you. Now, I'll tell you what a, a variation on this. While yes, there are some cases where if the man is doing his job, or if you have tried, if you're first making contact, you can be polite. But after one, not one, two, not two, ten, not ten, but hundreds of experiences like this, this man is not listening to you. This woman is not listening to you. This person needs to be woken up. Time to wake them up. And what's happened is, as, as in the case with Engler, I give the best example in my opinion, we're this far away from regional government, they've all been told that. Everybody is trying to curry favor because somebody is going to be the regional governor. Remember Star Wars? I, I'll remind everybody this was a beautiful parody on this. Grand Moff Tarkin comes into the room, the staff room, and he goes, the emperor is this and away with the last vestiges of the republic. The senate has been dissolved. They've been dissolved. And the one gentleman sitting at the table goes, well, how would he deal without the bureaucracy? And Brian Moff Tarkin goes, the regional government, governors will take over. Terror shall rule. They were laughing at us when they did that because they were talking about exactly what they intend to do to us. It is appropriate. It is exactly the situation we sit in right now. The regional governors owe allegiance only to the person who has given them the job. The person who will give them the job is the president. He will be assigned. He will not be voted in. Yes? Could Clinton have assigned uh, the regional governors at that last governor's convention? Was that last year? That's a good question. Did, the, did, did Clinton assign the regional governors in the last meeting uh, by, the, by the, at the last governor's convention? There were closed door sessions at each one of those. There have been watchdogs allowed into some, but in many cases they are not allowed in at all. Part of that was covered on C-SPAN 2 for almost the entire week during those meetings, and the tapes can be acquired concerning the open aspects of the meeting. Now, the components that were closed, it's up in the air. And this is very characteristic of everything that these people have done. If we are at peace now, I mean, consider this, people. Let's listen to the, to the, the crock of bowl that we've been fed. We're at peace. The big wars are all over because, after all, the the old Soviet Union is dead and gone. We may have communist China laying in the wings, but they're nothing by comparison to the communist threat in Russia. Now, if that's the case, then what are we worried about? Why are we securing all of this, this information from the people? In fact, it's the only people that can be securing all this information from is you and me. Not from any outside entity because there's nobody that big anymore. You see what I mean? So the only people that they're afraid of are the only perceived threat to the new world order that exists in the American citizen. That is, unless they're lying to us. Oh, well, maybe they're play acting. Another consideration of this scenario is, if we will not, if we will not acquiesce, if we will not bow down to the new world order, then they're going to find a way to buckle our knees. 
From the people who brought you World War I and II, presented <coughs> World War III with a cast of billions, coming to a neighborhood near you in Megacolor. Okay? All they need to do is take the cassette off the shelf, plug it in the machine, and we'll have a convenient mass war. This will allow them to implement everything that is needed. Now, it's not that there's a war on the horizon, but I'll tell you something that everybody's talked to me before. I'll remind you of techniques that are used. You open up your Time magazine this week, and the big article is what? Is it uh, the situation, uh, the economic situation in California? No. Not even Boston. Michael Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> Accused of child molestation. Yeah. News at 6, and we're going to take 18 minutes of news time and show you Michael Jackson. How about an hour? Or an hour. They did. Or two. Now, the thing is, now the thing about it is this. If you see that, and I almost guarantee you're going to have a Kennedy assassination program right next. Oh, we did. did we? we did. We got Kennedy papers, and we stood there to get all the Kennedy papers, didn't we? Watch my hand. Watch my hand. Oh, yeah. You didn't see that, did you? Oh, you didn't see it coming. Every time that something like this is taking place, I tell people to do this. Grab your ass because the bullets are going to start to fly. And you know what told me the most? Yesterday, in big block letters in the Detroit Free Press. Peace. Peace. Peace in our time. Peace. Peace. That's okay, Mowgli. Just lay on my lap. Peace. <laughs> That's our problem. Now I'll tell you what, when Desert Dust came around, all the Desert Storm, when they, when they invaded Kuwait, what was the big issue at the time? Anybody remember it? Probably don't because we really weren't paying attention to Kuwait. What the what? <laughs> well, what was interesting was Zsa Zsa Gabor slapping a police officer. Do you remember that? It got front page headline coverage. Now you tell me what that has to do with the news. But it has everything to do with this. Diversion. And diversion they are key at. And again, when they create massive diversion, that means that a bigger action is taking place. Bread and circuses. The empire lives on. Now we are the dangerous nexus, a very, a very important broiling point in time. Because they have to pray that we will remain ignorant. That is farthest from the truth, as far as I have seen. Because, again, as I've passed all over the country, I have talked to so many people, and everybody even at work comes up to me and goes like, and this is the best example, Mark. And they're tugging at my shirt. Mark, what happened to Rush? He likes Ross Perot. And I say, I don't listen to Rush. Okay? But what is happening with, these, with the news media that's approved? Ross Perot is a person that Rush Limbaugh hated with a passion during the election. Isn't it interesting how he has lived? Well, what I call him is like many of these other approved media people, they're called a pressure valve, or I will say a, a, a stop valve with a diverter. Okay? Their objective is to get you channeled, make sure that you don't get out the, outside the party lines now, and then we're going to start taking it to the left. And then we're going to go down the pipe a little farther, and we're going to take you a little farther to the left. Of all the people in this country you'd expect to see in favor of NAFTA, who came out in favor of NAFTA on his program? Rush Limbaugh. Yeah. He also made a statement a couple weeks ago that if they took the imprisonment of 50% of the population to restore order, he'd be willing to do it. Oh, yes. No, yes. Rush Limbaugh stated a couple days. A couple of days ago on his show that if, need, if, if it took the incarceration of 50% of the American people to restore order, he would go along with it. Remember, remember this, that if they do that, they will not let very many of us out. Now, I don't know about you people out there, but if all I have is my bare hands, which you're going to find in the ditch if you ever dig it up, if they ever got me that far, would be one guard under me with my teeth sunk into his neck, and another one with his head stuck around my hand, around my hand. Fingers, eyes, ears, whatever I can get in, but there'd be two of them in the hole under me. That's the difference between Europeans and the Americans for years. The Europeans, the Asians, the Africans, I don't care. We're an ornery bunch of people here in the United States. 
We haven't had two problems. You know where we learned it from? Fighting the Indians. The poor peasant farmers got out there and had to hold on to their piece of real estate, and the Indians were coming from one way, and the tax collectors were coming from the other. So you got to make up your mind. Well, first you knew you had to deal with business and then pleasure. First the Indians and the tax collector. <laughs> Is that simple? Very straightforward. Now because of that, we've been notoriously dangerous when we get when we get agitated. So they've done everything they can, again, like the jungle book, to have a little snake to keep us calm. He sings his little song. We get to watch Yaja slap the cop. We get to watch Michael, we get to suffer the whole poor Mike. Serves several purposes, by the way. Number one, Michael Jackson's been going down in fame, so we're going to give him some publicity. And in the same breath, keep people busy doing something else. Over here, over here, but never look at the Wizard of Oz. I am the great and powerful. Totally get away from that curtain, you bad puppy, you. Because of that, you can see this thing. Ooh! <laughs> oh, God. He's got it right. That's it. The horror. The horror. It's like the apocalypse now. If you remember the movie, the very end of it. The horror. Well, we didn't have to go overseas to find an enemy. It's come to find us, and there are there's treason within, treason within the country that has created the threat that we have. Treason is dealt with a trial and hanging. A friend of mine had this happen where they said, you want to kill the president or somebody? He said, oh, no, no, you don't, you, don't, you don't kill traitors. You execute them. And they didn't know how to respond to that because it's absolutely true. If you have committed treason against this country, hanging is the rule. That doesn't mean they won't try to hang a few of us simply because it'll be, you know, any punishment they can find will be acceptable. But to give you an idea, I'm talking to Linda Thompson, almost everybody here who's in, at this meeting has probably heard her on shortwave or heard about her by now. Anybody who's listening uh, in the audience on tape will recall that Linda Thompson uh, has military experience. She's uh, a lawyer out of Indianapolis. She was originally involved with the Waco situation that she tried to get out and assist them. Well, since she's been home, she's taken some of the advice that we generated about a half year ago, and she created an intelligence mechanism that's expanding constantly because it's all of you. Some of the things you say might be right, some of the things you say might be wrong because you're interpreting something, but if you do what I ask, write down who, what, where, when. What did you do? What were they doing? Take a simple photograph, even with a throwaway camera, but document what you see. I know a lot of us are talking about stuff, but you've got to become very, very consistent with this. We want documentation, the history of what happened in this country right up to and after the events that we're talking about. I don't want to lose this place in time. I want to be able to record it properly in the books. I want people to understand how the threat came about, what they did, and I can testify to somebody down the road that these are the facts, only the facts. Now, Linda found a place down in, in uh, Indiana that is very interesting because it's an old, what it was was a rail repair yard that was scheduled to be uh, destroyed approximately seven weeks ago. It's already condemned. The site was being shut down. Well, all of a sudden, they started spending money on this site. And this particular site, at a cost of between 10 and $12 million, is now completely fenced in, has internal compounds, the fence is all facing inward. All of the original doors and stru to the structures have been blocked over, and there's only one entrance at the end of a building four times the size of the building we're in right now. It is a massive complex. I have a packet of aerial photos that were given to us also by her people who did an aerial survey of the site. And it is big, and this is only one small portion of it. For the camera, I'm going to make sure get something here. Would you, would you explain? Uh, okay, uh, this, this the fence, the fence was facing inward. That means the top of the fence is angled inward. Angled into the building. In. That's right. Unlike the way they are normally done, thank you. Unlike the way fences are normally done to keep people out so they don't commit a crime, these fences are designed and angled inward to keep people from getting out of the fence, but nobody lives there. Well, gee, then why would you have the fence angled inward? And again, it's pretty obvious to make sure nobody gets out. Now, inside this fenced-in area overall, there are many smaller areas that are fenced in. Each one has a turnstile mechanism, like the one photographed here, to move from area to area. It is electronically controlled by sensor, not by card. And there's an interesting little picture in here in some of these of an all-seeing eye over each one of the turnstiles. It's red, it's about this large. 
And there is no writing, no picture other than the eye, no explanation of what it's for. Well, what I'm going to do is pass these pictures around. I trust you people not to make them disappear. If you want copies, you can make copies. But there's an interesting point. Linda's group had started to notice something else before they found this site, which I thought was most fascinating. I heard about but we just, we don't have enough time to check into everything. <clears throat> In this picture is a sign that says red zone. There are also signs that say green zone. There are other signs that say blue zone. Each one of those areas was fenced in. There are no normal truck entrances to this area, only turnstiles, so only people can pass from one of these little compounds to the next. That's the first thing that was interesting. The next one, there are six wind socks to allow helicopters to land inside this area. Now, Linda was doing a great job of taking pictures, and she got really excited about all these things that were going on. And she said, Mark, Mark, keep looking at the, the, gas, the gas pipes right here, the gas pipes, the gas pipes. I said, yes, Linda, that's interesting. But look over in the middle of the picture at what you missed. And in the middle of the picture, if you look closely, Tucked off in the middle of all these buildings is enough support equipment to keep about five helicopters operational on the ground. Hmm. All military munitions and, and, and ordnance support. What's that doing in the middle of a train in the middle of a train service center? Now this train service center, by the way, is serviced by only one line. It's off a spur. It is not on a main track. So when you look at these aerial photographs, this expands out in an area with 12 lines with reception areas off the lines. In other words, when you pull a train in, the whole area where the train sits is fenced in. The zones are on the outside perimeter. You will go to zone red, well, now you will be shot. You will go to zone green, you will end the woman over there too. The green zone now, please. Very easy to sort people out as they come out of the cars, or if they're in pads, I'm, I'm assuming more than perhaps some people would like to think, but inside the compound where the other compounds are, are individual signs by red zone, blue zone, green zone. Now what wasn't pictured here are some very large, and we saw some of the pipes for them in the aerial photos, are some massive furnaces that were brought in. We don't know what that, they look something like scotch boiler systems. But they're vast, and they are can be used as incinerators. Use your, use your imagination. Yeah, has anybody tried to find out what these <coughs> buildings were for? Originally, the site was used by Amtrak or as a service center. It was transferred over to some other authority. There is a picture of the company name. Now, she's a lawyer, and she knows how to track things down, and they've got investigative personnel working on this. The company whose name was used for the contractor sign does not exist. There's no tracing the company. It does not exist. So, so the money is there, but the money, and the money came from the Fed. And over here, you have a fictitious name. When you can put these together and add other parts, it has the stench of a, of a black bag operation, covert operation. And that has to do with Central Intelligence Agency, Defense Intelligence Agency, or whoever. We don't know who's financing this, by the way, not yet. And it may even be classified to the point where we cannot. <coughs> However, interestingly enough, this set of pictures was done before the compound pictures. And this is a real compound, by the way. This is a compound. A church and a household is not a compound. Right. So when you talk about Waco, always correct yourself concerning that. I've even had to do it on the radio program. I said, please, don't call it a compound, call it a church. Everybody's doing this now. The problem is even when you're talking, we've been so inundated with propaganda from 51 days worth of siege that I'll even start to rattle it out of my mouth as quickly as I told somebody not to. But you have to keep conditioning yourself because it demonstrates the power of the Bhutu and the media and how heavily we were indoctrinated by them by the other side. <clears throat> now, we get into something that was very interesting that they done, started taking pictures of but they didn't understand what they were looking at. Now, I want everybody to see this because it's happening in Michigan now and you're going to find it when you go home tonight. On the back of many of the road signs in your area, you're going to see markers and stickers. You never saw before, yes. They're in different parts of the state. These markers will be about half the size of this picture. They will have a corner cut out of one of the, one corner will be cut out from the middle of the top of the rectangle to one third down the side. That allows you to create four markers from one tag. All you need to do is change the position of the cut corner, okay? They are in three colors, people. Red, blue, and green. 
Why couldn't we find out from the State Department what these things are? Because they, they won't, won't tell you. They're road signs. They're road signs, but they're being used by somebody else, and we've already asked. Now, there is a DOT sticker that is about this size, and that is, is put out by the state. However, we think that they've used some of the DOT stickers because if you notice on some road nets, all the signs have them. But on other road nets, only one sign in 10 will have them. Now on the other hand, the other markers we're talking about are so large, and if you're going down the road, now I'm talking, if you're going down the road and you're facing traffic this way, the signs are marked on the opposite side. Also, above you on the road signs at intersections. Now somebody tried to come up with the idea, oh, it's vandalism, it's vandalism. Right. Well, somebody, some vandal had to make the effort to stretch out a 30-foot ladder, and in these photographs, every sign was marked, but one sign was doubly marked. And this changes depending upon the intersection, so obviously we have a pattern. Another thing, when you come up on an intersection, you'll find that the sign is a single marker, a single marker, and then two markers. Now, how would you use this? Well, if any of you have been in the military, you recall your running lights on your military vehicles? You can move through an area with stealth. Your conventional sublighting would illuminate this, so you don't have to worry about trying to find a road map or figure out where you're going. And you can follow these markers anywhere in the state that you want, to whatever location you've been designated to go to. Now that's strange, because who would need stupid markers like this? In other words, why not give our very well-educated troops a little more information? Well... If you can't read English and you don't know where you're going, would it not behoove you to make it as simple as possible so that your pea little brain will be able to interpret what it is we have in the way of information? Get close to the mic. Yep, I'm sorry. And for that reason, with the way the system is set up, <clears throat> what we have here is a complete marking system for routes to and from perhaps detention facilities to and from key industrial complexes or key food storage sites. Because in many of the rural areas, the markers end with their major silos. Now, why would they be so worried about going out to the grain silos? Hmm. He who controls the food, controls the people. He who controls the water, controls the industry. We have everything in that place right here, all at once. Now, yes. People down the meat and been trying to get rentals and stuff like that, a lot of pound quantities and so on. Are they been out? Yes. Generally, bulk food is, we are at the lowest level, by the way. The way to interpret that, people have been trying to access bulk food in good quantities. <clears throat> the problem with it is this. The Department of Agriculture in 1990 refused to print its food reserve numbers because our food reserve was non-existent. In 1990, for 12, or for a total of the entire for a total of the entire 10-month um, period that they kept everything blank, we went below what was considered to be red line. Now, red line through the entire history of the United States has been 69 days, okay? Red line means that you're below what is considered to be the minimal storage time available. We have been at 19 days food reserves for over about a year and a half. Even during the American Revolution, when many of the farmers went to war, we never sank below 74 days food reserves. Now, comrade worker, or Tubari Shkobotni, depending on how you want to look at it, what you have here is somebody who's used plant farming to drop us to starvation levels for a reason. I will repeat again. He who controls the food controls the people. Can we take care of ourselves? Absolutely, yes. Do we have the reserves for ourselves? Yes. To assist other people? Yes. If it's executed properly, no. We've said this time and time and time again. What is, I've never, I haven't seen a frozen bag of peas kill anybody yet. Okay, so if you're on again, if you don't belong with everything else I say, buy some food, put it away, and become less of a problem. Okay, you won't have to worry about choosing between heating and eating in the middle of December. Because that's what this all comes down to. If you create an economic catastrophe, if you have conflict inside the United States, 
the money we have in our pockets is called Federal Reserve notes isn't worth toilet paper. The Russians just found this out, remember, three weeks ago. Right. They devalued their currency exactly the way we've described them doing here because they did it to them first. Why did they do that, by the way? So that all the other countries that are affected will be stable and have converted their currency before the United States. So that when our money is devalued, they can come in from outside and purchase anything they want and walk away. Germany, 1947, after the war. The bankers carried the house away. It's the same thing all over again. But in the process, for those of you who might have some money put away, that even if you transfer over into the new blue chip dollar, or decide you're going to take that chip fill, you are going to still have some form of resource that they're going to want. So we're going to create a food problem, which we already have. And once we demonstrate the food problem, oh, by the way, the cost of heating will have gone up. Your available cash will have gone down. And the scales tip this way, eating or eating. Now you need to look into your children's eyes and tell them to either starve or freeze to death this way. Not necessarily freeze to death, but pretty rough shape. And you can, of course, balance it out. You get to freeze a little, eat, you know, not eat a little. Not, not eat some, not eat a lot. Not eat a lot. Either way, what are they doing? They're doing just what they did to the Russians. Get in the line. Get in line. Don't worry about that guy they're chasing that they just mowed down in the street. You're worried about your little paper bag being filled up with this week's allotment of rice. Well, I don't want to be with him. That, that poor sucker deserved what he got because he's not in line. Right? That's what this is all about. That's what this is leading to. It, it's, it's classic. The sad part is that there are enough educated people that aren't out there. They're educated in the wrong way. So what we need to do Prepare, purchase food, challenge this situation, start watching your roads. We know that M33 has already been hit, M106 has already been hit. It started from the Indiana border and worked its way up, so it's all through our county right now. In fact, it's, all, it's working its way through Washington, Jackson. It's up into the middle of the state. US 10, I believe also. Okay, US 10. Now what these do, I'll give you an idea how these markers would work, because a lot of people don't understand. Well, what would be the significance of these markers? Well, Conrad, I'm, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Strelenko, 16th Guards Tank Army, and I've been dropped in here to take care of this American problem. I don't speak very good English, unlike some of my political officer counterparts. I got 56, 57 prisoners I just picked up over here on Main Street. I'm on a road, and I don't know where it is. Well, I'll tell you what. In the middle of town here is a marker, or will be soon, that says one or zero. It is the geographic hypo center of the town. Out from that town, there are road signs that will be instead will be put into place that are marked every mile. South, north, east, west. Lieutenant Colonel Strelenko doesn't know where he is really, but on the radio he reports, I'm at mile marker 10, north district, red route, pick up prisoners on my smoke. Helicopter comes in, and I don't have to take my ground transports back out to empty prisoners. I walk the prisoners over to the helicopter, in, 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 oh, I'm trying to get away. Okay, in, in, in. And when I get them in the helicopter, they don't get on the ground until they're in the camp, and nobody gets away. Because they understand something else. If I know you're in that truck, God help them, I'll try to get you back. But a prisoner in the air is virtually harmless. They can move with a Chinook 50, 58 to 64 prisoners at a time, crowd them in light, and shackle them to the bottom of the helicopter. The Chinook is a cargo craft with dogs. You can shackle them in the chopper, wait to get the other end, and process them out. Women, children, everybody. Make no mistake about it, we're all threatened here. They can be used for a variety of other projects, uh, but primarily with the command and control and identifying areas for pickups. I think they decided they can't trust the guard people. The guards being done away with, and the few guards will be reorganized, those guard units will be kept because they are now the Praetorian, they're the new empire. Those people have been tested and trusted. I think that 50% of our special forces have been done away with also, or have already gone over to the other side. Not all of them, but about 50%. These forces have career lines to worry about, and they're worried about making a paycheck. They're stuck in Somalia. That's right. They sent them to Somalia. Remember this, uh, what were we in Somalia for? Oh, to feed people, that's why we're mowing them down by the droves now. 
Well, okay. remember you want to start to peel those blue stickers. Just every well, it's a good idea that it should be done, or if you can, we'll really mess them up, I think. Not that I would ever do this, but I would imagine that if a vandal, <laughs> that if a vandal were probably to cut a little larger piece of tape that was the same size but in another color, and consistently did that on down the road, that it might create a problem for these individuals. But that would only be if we had vandals involved. And I know that all of you people here are law-abiding citizens. Who would report those vandals if they saw them? What about a spray can? Spray can would probably work, but they still know there was a root there. It's best to change the, you know, it'd be best if they were to do this, that the route would probably be changed. In other words, uh, how would you know that you were going the right road if at an intersection you are going somewhere else now? That could tie up hours, minutes, days. It's all a matter of how well you do. Now, because of this, there are some other considerations, too, that should be thought about. I did a program in New Orleans two weeks ago. When I talked, we gave them everything we've always talked about in one big lump. We trashed them with everything we could. What was really fun was this. The guy who had the program went down to City Hall to take care of some business. He goes into City Hall, and these people come up and go, Ron, Ron, are you going to have that program today with the guy speaking? And he goes, yeah, and he goes, well, we've turned on the PA system, we're going to pump it into every room in City Hall. <laughs> Everybody's going to hear it here in New Orleans. And he goes, okay, and he's like, oh, wow, that's really, that's great, you know. So he went back to the station. They all thought it was going to come out at 1 o'clock. So at 1 o'clock, City Hall called up and said, you got that guy on the TV on the radio? What's wrong? Isn't he going to be on the program? It was because it was an hour early, and they didn't know that it was, I, I still had an hour to go. When we got on, we covered everything. We had calls, giving an idea of people all the way from the southern part of Florida to the western panhandle of Texas. We had dozens of callers, and the first thing he says, and this is funny because everybody knows we don't promote the stuff that we do, Mark, I've seen your tape. And the first thing you got to think of is which one. <laughs> okay. And then it's like everybody should see it. We've seen this, and we've seen this, and we've seen this, and my son just came out of the active military, and he says what we're talking about is absolutely true. And of course, the next caller calls up. And what's funny, we got the one from Louisiana. She goes, Mark, I've seen your tape, and I know what's going on. But did I tell you about this woman? She did 1,500 copies of your tape and gave them all away. Now, I don't mind, but do you realize what that means? You are definitely not alone. And that's what really, what really builds me up. Well, two days after we did this program, though, something happened in Louisiana that made everybody load their pants. Because down there, they heard about it before you did. Fort Polk, Louisiana was made a United Nations Facilities Training Headquarters for UN forces in the United States. The 5th Infantry Division has been transferred out of Fort Polk and was to be, mind you, transferred to Fort Hood. Some parts of this element have not shown up in Fort Hood, which is rather strange. But remember, with Comrade Gorbachev coordinating the military base cuts, which is what he is supposed to be doing now, by the way, uh, which, if that isn't vulgar, I don't know what is. I can't even, I'm not surprised I put that out in one sentence. But say goodbye, Mark. Oh, not yet. Yeah, okay. say goodbye. Then we'll know okay. the film today. Remember this. This is a country unto itself. I will mention that. In World War II, this was the bulwark of our final defense for the United States, if you look at our strategic uh, reserve concept of industry. This is the heart of America. Not this, not this, not the coast, whatever. This. You controls the water, controls the world. That's their concern, and that's what they need this for. Yes? What did you hear in the last two days about the FDA and bottled water? Yes. Uh, well, the FDA, not just, uh, we just said, what did we hear about the FDA and bottled water? It's about the restriction concerning, uh, concerning the usage, manufacture, production, and control thereof. Not just water, mind you. Yes, not just water, but virtually everything and anything having to do with health food also. Now, anybody who's standing here usually has a pet peeve. Mark's pet peeve is the militia, to a certain extent, and of course, the Second Amendment. It's not the only thing I'm interested in, but it's my concern because without force, of course, we don't win. Okay? We still honor God, but we've got to have force in force. We have to have, a, we have, to have the temporal capability to defend ourselves. Some people are into food and drugs, some people are into the Constitution in general, some people are into land patents, whatever. The issue here, though, is that they all are overlapping. They all culminate in a single event. What we'll do, let me back over here. Rather be dance around. 
what they're, what, we're, what they're doing for us, thank you, Lord, is demonstrating that they are all interlocked. No single pet project is the only thing you should be worrying about. With the control of food and drugs, or in this case, with the control of health food, it's a preamble to the socialist health care package. Again, because they don't want you to take care of yourself. They must make it illegal for you to take care of yourself. It will be a felony just basically to take aspirin by the time you're done, or possess it, probably. It's that simple. Everything will be a felony. This is the king's law. This is what happened back during the revolution before. Virtually everything the colonists did when they turned around was, was illegal, culminating eventually the revolution that formed this nation. These people are in the same situation. With every step, with every way that we find to get around them, they have to try and connive a way to stop us. And eventually, if we were to keep inundating them, we've actually reversed the little Dutch boy syndrome. You see? They only have so many arms, they only have so many legs. The problem is this. As we've stopped them, they realize that they have to show more and more of their mask, more and more of their true nature. And thank you again, Lord, for doing that because they are evil incarnate. It's just they've tried to they try to embellish it with a few extra, you know, some airbrushing here and there, take a little red off, buff the horns down a little bit. But eventually this stuff falls off with time. And what's happening is with each turn and with each twist of the knife, more and more of that image is exposed. With this, we can see exactly where they're headed. If the, yes, Michigan and Area 5 are the, lead, are the key and the linchpin for us to hold, that'll be our job. We don't have to worry about California. We aren't going to have to worry about the East Coast. We'll be left to hold on to our own piece of real estate right here. But if we do, if we do, we've done a great harm, the likes of which they can't recover from. Now, another thing I just mentioned, and people, if it doesn't make you shudder, I don't know what it does. <coughs> Mr. Gorbachev is directly involved in deciding the fate of our U.S. military forces. Mr. Gorbachev was with the NSKVD in 1942. His job was to execute people. He wasn't a person who was a soldier. He was a murderer. His job was to participate in the last great purge of the Soviet. We can't hear so His job was to eliminate the last, was to participate in the last great purge of the Soviet under Stalin. From 1942 on to 1953, 54, 29 million people probably died. The estimates are not, are not accurate depending upon which country it counts. And since the other side isn't printing numbers, we can't change them, and we won't. But realistically, Mr. Gorbachev was a man who pulled the trigger. Not a person who just happened to be thrown into a position by accident. He was in the secret police. His reward for pulling the trigger was to be given a higher place of authority. And yet a higher place of authority. And then to eventually, comrade worker, become premier of the Supreme Soviet. Now, if you can look me square in the eye and honestly believe that we can trust this man, then leave this room right now. Because I, I'll sell you a bridge or some swamp in Florida, and I don't care which, I'm sure I'll make some money. Because this person, there's either two ways to look at it. Either this whole Cold War thing was a crock, which I really do believe. Or we've just turned history on its head with the events that have taken place. And in fact, they've done a good job of making sure we don't hear much about Mr. Gorbachev. But all of a sudden, he popped up out of the woodwork. One minute he's overseas, then there's a few quips here about him being on the East Coast and the West Coast. Now he's making policy in the United States. Uh-uh, kids. You better again, like I said, grab right here. And what is he doing? He's exposing the entire seaboard, both East and West of the United States. If our strategic capabilities to defend the coast are not maintained, I don't care what you say about wonder toys, manpower is what takes property. The bulwark of this nation, the national defense that we have had, has ensured that for over 100 years we have not fought against a military force on the, on the, on the soil of the continental United States. But I'm sure somebody's going to help change that very quickly, aren't they? Is that why they're closing all the airports? All the air bases that are closed right now, unless you're all in Michigan, this is the Michigan tape. Let's take our convenient state map here. We only had three federal bases in Michigan. All the border. Yeah, they're all gone too, aren't they? 
Now, they're doing this in every state. Everybody's going, man, you're closing all my bases. Oh my goodness, what's happening here? The Upper Peninsula lost it. We got Worsworth out. Sulphur just lost about 20%. We'll lose 50% of its resources. What's left in Michigan? Battle Creek uh, Air Station, which has a total of 15 aircraft, and they're all they're all tactical aircraft, not strategic air defense aircraft. We got five Warthogs, maybe over in Grand Rapids, kids and countrymen. That's 20 aircraft, and all of them are tactical ground attack used against us, or used for use against you know ground targets, not air targets. Where are all these aircraft going? Since the aircraft are already paid for, there's no reason for us to get rid of them. Why not fly them until they're no longer worthwhile? and then put them in mothball fleets. But instead, we seem to be taking them out of service and destroying them. Why? Well, under the New World Order, if we have the capability to resist what they have planned for us, it'd be pretty darn embarrassing for us to have air superiority, wouldn't it now? Why not make the guard bigger is another question. Always you get bigger bang for the buck if you maintain a large guard and drop off the active army. We did it after World War II, we did it after World War I, we did it after the Civil War. We're not doing that now. There's a reason. We don't want the US, the U.S. population to be able to defend itself. The Guard lives, eats, and breathes with us. Some of them are stupid enough to go along with the program, but not all of them. And the ones that are with us are the ones that count, because they're in the majority and they always will be. Out with Randy Weaver is probably the best example. When Randy Weaver was under siege on the second day of the Guard from the Nevada National Guard, the personnel were there, mutiny. They refused to participate, and because of that, as a show of good faith, the FBI wanted the, the uh, I'm sorry, the Idaho National Guard to disarm themselves. Even the officers mutinied. And because of this, their weapons were taken away, they were deactivated, they were given sophisticated aluminum clubs, M16s that did not function. They were given radios that did not work, and they were sent out in the woods in the middle of nowhere so they wouldn't bother anybody. That's a classic example of how the guard is going to respond because they live with the people. When they told them, oh, that guy's a, he's done this and that and the other, and that guy's a crazy this and that, the people who live in the community said, you're out of your mind, kiss my butt. So they had to get rid of those weapons, they had to get rid of those men, and then bring in some other players who were more in line with the new party. Cherish the guard and cherish the militia. And make sure that you maintain it. The guard hasn't always been friendly, but it's a heck of a lot better than a centralized national police force or a centralized military force from outside the country. Where will they go with this otherwise? Well, if Mr. Gorbachev has his way to weaken our coastal defenses, knock down, say, 50% of our naval forces, the other side hasn't knocked down theirs, Production of the Soviet Union continues to increase. Several members have demonstrated by showing us photographs of the largest Soviet truck plant that just conveniently burned. The uh, Soviets, oh, I'm sorry, the Commonwealth. That's another name we should fear because Commonwealth has to do with what is indicative of the British Empire. The sun never sets on the empire, by the way. Things haven't changed at all, have they? History repeats itself over and over and over again. Well, because of this, we're going to give them a new truck plant at $3 billion. Remember when they met in Japan, the G7? We're going to give the Russians a $3 billion aid package to build the biggest truck plant on the planet now to make sure that there are no American truck plants in business by the time they're done. GM will probably help to build it like they did the last one during the ha-ha Cold War. When they build it, the Russians were supposed to promise never to use it for military production, and the next week it was cranking out gas 63 trucks for the Soviet Army, used all over the planet. Looked just like one of our GMC trucks. Strange enough, I can't understand why. So, with all these friends that we have inside the country, I'm sure they have much more in store for us, and they do, but what can we do to counter it? With all these activities, with the Butcher Winkle on one hand and the Foreign Internationals on the other, still both in the same camp, People go, oh boy, Mark, I even know why you're up here talking. We ought to go home and blow our brains out. Well, no, I hope you don't do that. If you've got that much motivation, go down the road and find one of them. <laughs> okay? Because, you know, if you got it, it's like uh, I said this, I had this problem back here in the 60s. I'll relate a story in about 60, but it was the late 70s when, uh, and into the early 80s. We went around in different parts of Washington County when they were trying to get rid of civil defense. 
And this woman goes, well, I don't see why you want to live. You'd lose your house. I'd burn the house. I'd burn the house down behind me, lady. You don't understand. If I thought the other side was going to get it, I will take care of my family, my friends, my countrymen. I will secure my country as best I can, protect my documents, specifically the Constitution, to ensure that my children have an inheritance. And I will stay alive whatever it takes to ensure that the Republic prevails. What was fascinating is I said, well, you know, after a while I kept hearing this, I said, I, I can't argue with it all. You'd rather die than live through something like this. So do me a favor, go to your house, turn off the gas, shut off the electricity, close your curtains, lock the doors, put all your food in the cardboard boxes, go out back and dig a hole for me. If you got any weapons or ammunition, stack them up over by the front door too. Leave the keys hanging in the back, dig a hole in the backyard, take a steak knife, slip your wrist, roll into it, and save the ammunition so I'll have it later. <laughs> Saves me a lot of trouble though. They don't know how to respond. You know, there's, there's this general attitude, the world can't go on living without me. It'll be just fine without Mark, it'll be just fine, fine with a lot of us when the time comes. We all have a day to go. In the meantime, we will live to the fullest we possibly can, and we have an obligation to do everything that we can to make sure this planet is better. When we say better, though, that means with a viable constitutional republic in place to demonstrate a oh yes, to demonstrate, thank you, to demonstrate just what we can do when this republic runs properly, because this is the finest form of government available, despite what anybody says. Somebody told me before, we'll work. If we win, they're going to come back. Yes, they're going to come back time and again and time and again because you know what? It's kind of like anything else. If you've got something worthwhile, greed always dictates that somebody's going to come back to try and take it. Now, does that mean you open your doors and let the thief come in and carry it away? No. That means you have to take precautions. You have obligations. There are things that you must do to ensure that your wealth is protected. There's no greater wealth we can pass to our children than that document first. We have a birthright and an inheritance like which no other country can possess right now. Until we clean up our porch, by the way, and this is something that gets me about this going overseas, until we clean up our own backyard, take care of our porch, and sustain the republic, we have no business going overseas. What if we can perceive a real threat, not a bunch of dirt peasants in Somalia wearing wearing ramshackle third party clothes, armed with a minimal amount of weapons really by comparison which is no threat to the United States at all. We have no business going over there for that. But if we can perceive a real threat, we go over like we've done before, kick the shit out of them, win, and come home. It's their business taking care of their country after that. What about cleaning up the White House? Well, that's, a good, that's, that's what we do first. I'm just saying, but if we have it in the process, see, I'll also explain to you my theory about what's gonna happen with this war. And it's just a rule. In the United States, if we were to, if we were to get into a conflict right now, it'd take us three years just to secure the country. Minimum. Three years minimum. That's the best I could hope for. If we do that, by the third year, no later than the third year, we would be involved in the second phase. When the enemy would decide that we are losing our resources, that they're losing their resources, that we are regaining our nation. And that's when the true enemy would appear. Because there are many vultures circling outside our borders right now waiting to take their talons and dig them into this meat. So the next seven years will be spent protecting the Republic the rest of the way. We won't get all of our property back, and we will lose a great number of people we should have been able to preserve. But we will win. Now in Chicago I said this, and it was really interesting, I you know, said I believe we will win, I believe we'll be able to drive them from our borders. But that's as far as we'll be able to go. And this guy in the back of the room, there's about 500 people there, he goes, yes? He goes, no! And everybody turned and looked at him. And he said, we can't stop. And everything went dead silent. You could have heard a pin drop in there. I mean, you hear it on the tape, too, because it just went quiet. Everybody started thinking. He goes, if we let them get away, they're going to come back. we got to follow them and chase them across the planet. <laughs> and the whole place went, yes! Just like that. That's the difference between us and all the other countries. We're very good friends if you're friendly with us. But God help you if we get pissed. And that's, I didn't have to say it, the whole crowd said it. So you're not alone in your thinking, because a lot of people say, Mark, we gotta catch, we're gonna have to finish them off. I would like to, but I realistically think that we may have to lick our wounds for a little bit, as the revolutionaries did, because we can only go so far at this time. We've lost resources, we'll have to build back up. 
We've lost an industry that we cannot replace because of age and the lack of retraining, of training people properly to do the right jobs. The flipping hamburger routine ain't going to get you but so many dollars, but when it comes time, you can't turn this into bullets or beans. You see what I mean? Industry, the wealth, the shining star of our nation is lost right now. In fact, it has a very great gap that is expanding rapidly. It is the real generation gap right now. With every week, we lose another skilled trader somewhere who is leaving the work process and is not going to train another man or men to replace him. That's another skill lost off in the dust of time. It took us 200 years to get what we are right now. So all you guys out there who are a little older, and I beg you to do this, find a young person who is interested. You may have to seek him out. You may have to go figure out a way to do it. Hell, even use the socialists if you have to. Take their, their programs, take their little mentor programs and use it against them. Go out and find a kid who is willing to learn. Make him a, a tool maker. Make him a wheelwright. Make him an electrician. Make him whatever you have to that you know and educate him because you're doing more to damage the enemy than anything else. Because again, let's throw it in here. When that is done, there aren't going to be even these, these petty pain jobs left. The border shall be a swarm with all form of vermin. It will be all over the place. Now I'm talking from South America, Central America. The borders will open. People do not realize that what you're going to have here is a total destruction of wealth. At least people had a chance to come in and become a citizen and earn. And then you can send the money back to your people out here, Italy, Mexico, Japan, people have done this for years, all of you had relatives somewhere, and your family sent some money back to help support the family in some way. I guarantee it happened. But it won't happen anymore. This is the great leveling. The great leveling doesn't mean, as I always said this, which do you think is easier? To elevate the whole planet to a higher level and make them, feed them better, clothe them better? Uh -uh. It is easier to cut the slats off underneath the United States and buckle us to our knees and let us all sit together in the dirt. Mm -hmm. Orwell, 1984, you've got to read it over again because it is so prophetic with this person in charge now. 1984 is here. In fact, 1993, the book was a little, well, it wasn't even late. They wanted it done by 1984. Yeah, it was going to be 94 now, yes. Well, the point is that it's here. And the sad part is, that it's again, I wish it wouldn't happen. Wish in one hand, defecate in the other, and see which one gets full first. We all know that one, okay? So since we can't wish it away, the solutions. Educate people. Educate people in, in physical trades. Educate people in our government and how it works. Make it a great power, but it has to be a great power through its people. You can't pay to have it done. You can't buy it. The next step, government's not going to protect you. You have to protect yourself. To do that, arm yourself for truth. Throughout the history of this nation, we have been armed people. We don't take anything from anybody for that reason, and we won't in the future again. When you do this, cheaper's better. We need to arm everybody we can. A $600 rifle's nice, but if you got five people to arm, you better recalculate and figure out what it is you can afford. Your SKS rifle, your bolt action they got, your 1903 Springfield, your single shot shotgun will get you all the AKs and M16s you need because you're not going to fight fair anyway. He who fights fair loses. It is that simple. The American soldier learned uh, very quickly, as George Washington said, American soldier isn't worth anything to try and hold a flat piece of real estate. He won't stand for a minute. But you give him a tree or a fence post or a big stone fence, and he'll hang on to it for dear life and fight like hell. And that's the way we are. We can't. Mama didn't raise no stupid kids. Okay? That's how we'll have to fight again. It'll be ones against tens, twos against threes. We pick the time that we fight. Don't let the enemy do that for you. We must make it a terror with respect to that to live in this nation as an aggressor against the American people. Right. We will make them a curse upon our lips. That's right. If they walk on our land, we salt the piece of real estate they walk on. If they sit in a chair, we burn it. How do you better know who they are? They will be very overt. This woman is very overt. These people are not going to even hesitate to be even, they aren't even going to hide when the time comes. I'll tell you that right now. They already have it in their mind. It's like that lieutenant governor. They already have it in their mind that they've won. 
They really do. They've had to psych their people up. Now I'll tell you this, a lot of people have said two years out, two years out, two years out. If it were not for a bunch of loudmouths like me, it would have been two years out or three years out. I'm not just thumping my chest. My ambition was to create enough of a stir, and I think we have, that they had to rethink what they thought they could accomplish. That's right. There are only two kind of times, by the way, yes, when you when you wage war from a strategic angle. Number one, you start in the spring, the very early spring, so you have the spring through the summer into the fall to fight. You will deny the enemy the capability to manufacture food for his next season. You will control whatever food reserves exist, and you will be able to engage an enemy for the longest period or fighting period if possible to ensure that you accomplish your goals. However, there is another time, and that's in the fall. Because all of the harvest sits in only a handful of locations, is easily controlled, and through the winter it comes right back to that basic formula, heating or eating. Either way. And if you're a refugee, and that's the first weapon used in every war, by the way, is refugee. The refugees help to consume your resources like a locust. He clogs your roads. He takes up housing. He requires feeding and sustenance. He'll require all the medical support you do. So refugees are, val are valuable, but they can be used both ways. I will remind you of this, as I said before, people who collaborate with the other side or people who think it's a good idea should be noted. And I think we should send them the people who support them the best to the other side. If we win, by the way, we will have to follow our justice system. We will try them, and I will hang as many traitors as I can get my hands on. But there are many others who are collaborating who think it's entertaining to be part of the middle class group in between patriots and treason who hope to profit either way. I think we should send them on their way to a glorious social regime in Europe, which is what they wanted to be a part of anyway. Give them one piece of luggage and send them to the socialist paradise of their choice. I believe in justice and mercy, and I think that's the best of all, because think about this. All of their writings have stated, for instance, in, in Dakotas they said this. This was, this was a Rothschild speaking. When we get rid of the cannon fodder, you know, 75% of the American people, then we can bring into this country the people that we want. Now this was a comment made by one of the people who's making the decisions right now, and in fact, he is traveling to Vietnam next week with David Rockefeller. His objective is to see 75% of the American people dead one way or another. Now, if they can't accomplish that goal here, how long do you think those traders will survive overseas if they're already having problems feeding their own people? It's kind of justice, you know, it's mercy tempered with justice. I will not have to raise a hand against them. It won't be necessary. Yes? They only have to worry too long about the newly ordained king because by usurpation of authority and by right of inheritance, King Albert, former Prince Albert of Belgium, has usurped the authority of his own, the, the reigning kingship of his own nephew. Yes. He's taken it over, and he's the one that implemented Operation Slip. Yeah. An interesting thing, I always show this, or at least I did the last time, we'll make sure it's in the tape, so everybody who's never seen this before, or doesn't have the serial in their part of the country, if they've seen the tape, the regional governments of America, or the regions of America, as it says here. This was originally on the small kicks boxes, and then it disappeared for a while. Now it's on the big kicks boxes, so you get to see it more often. In bigger picture, it's a bigger picture, more color, more excitement. Yes, the people who brought you the United Nations. Three things, well, four things, that should be noted here. Number one, not anywhere on this picture does it say United States. Nowhere. All of the state names are so small that they cannot be read, but the regional names are big enough that they're the first to be identified. Washington, D.C. is not on the map. The only political symbol on the map is the United Nations symbol. Now, for those of you who haven't seen it before, or now that you know about it, let me include this number, 1-800-328-11. 4-4. Kix wants to know, and General Mills wants to know, what you think about this box. And you know what? I think every half hour of the day, since it's a free call and they're paying for it, you should all call and tell them where they can stop this box of Kix. See how that works? I thank them for that 1-800 number. And again, I'll repeat it. 1-800. 328 44 Weekdays, by the way. 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Remember, kicks are for kids. Kicks. I 
I'm sorry. 7.30 in the morning to 5 p.m. in the afternoon, Central Standard Time. Now, I'll pass this around so we can get a chance to take a look at it. Now, if that doesn't get you, I don't know what will, but uh, by the way, if you watch uh, Emperor Blight, oops, I mean uh, Bill Clinton's last uh, speech, when he was talking about the floods in the Midwest, did he use a United States map or did he use a regional map? Nobody was thinking. He used that regional map as his map when he was demonstrating the flooding in the United States. Yes. Take a look. If you videotape it, open up your video camera, plug the sucker back in, and take a look at that. Because they're inundating us with so many ways, so that we'll keep using like words like uh, compound, region. We so get so used to it, we start we start implementing their vocabulary. Vocabulary is very crucial, just like he was talking about earlier today. With vocabulary, you control people. You control definition. And we have to understand the definitions that they're using. Now, the regional governors, for instance, will have total power over life and death. And to understand that, you must understand the New States of America Constitution. New States of America Constitution, Article 2. The practice of religion shall be a privilege, not a right, to be determined by the overseer. Who's the overseer? It's not defined. The overseer is the empire. The New World Order. Now in addition to that we have for instance under Article 7 uh, the practice of trial shall be determined by a judge not by the plaintiff. Now consider this. Implementation of a trial service for instance what would that have done to Randy Weaver if a judge had been sitting on that instead of a trial, instead of a jury, he'd be in jail right now or dead. But because the individual can decide whether or not there will be a jury trial or a judge that, that presides over it, it saved his life. He took his chances in the roll of the dice with 12 people. You won't have that right anymore. Every other inalienable constitutional right that is in the first document is gone from the second. All of it is arbitrary. When a right becomes arbitrary, it is no longer a right. It is a privilege granted in some way for a deed, for an active action that takes place. Well, what kind of benefit do you get, or what do you have to do to get that benefit? Uh, let's see, uh, I get to tell people about the SKSs in my neighbor's house, and I get to keep his piano after they confiscate his property and his guns. Gee, Nazi Germany, 1939, Bolshevik Russia, 1931. Only the names and the languages have been changed, that's all. And the same players are involved, by the way, the same people who finance the whole operation. Can we win? Yes, we will. I have to say this three times through the whole thing, okay? We will win. It will be painful, depending entirely upon your preparations. Do not, after you hear this, go out and commit super coup. Like I said, if you want to do that, I'll, I'll show you somebody. <laughs> Don't get pissed at somebody, okay? Don't do that suicide thing. Not that I ever want to see anything happen to this person because we love her. We know that she's obviously protecting the Constitution and Bill of Rights for all of us, isn't she? Yeah, right. Now, our concern has been uh, has, has been uh, brought up about different activities taking place with different agencies, and I'll cover this very quickly. On Friday, we were given some information on the siege that's taking place in Connecticut. We don't know all of the information, but the Department of the Interior and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms are presently laying siege to a small component of an Indian reservation in the northern part of Connecticut. It appears to be Mohawk. Now, what happened is apparently the state uh, gave unconditional orders that the uh, Mohawks, or the Indians in this case, were to surrender taxes. The Indians said, sure, you can have the taxes, come in and get them. Needless to say, they understood what the threat meant. So as the situation stands right now, the ATF is now participating in this has created a one mile perimeter around the site. Only one done, mile? Only one mile, they're in fairly close range. But the site is much larger, it's many, many more acres, all of the houses are spread out much more. So it should be remembered that uh, we have a situation developing there. There are several other churches throughout the country. We may not necessarily agree with everything that they say, 
but we understand exactly what the intention is. Gentlemen, if you will not hang together, we shall surely hang separately. The founding fathers of the United States understood that and voiced it directly. I may not agree with everything that they say, but I also have promised this. There will not be another Waco. That was the last one. Habits like that have a tendency to become very dangerous because the government has a tendency to stick to it. If they can get with it, get away with it once, they will get away with it again. By the way, how many people did note that uh, two days ago it has been proposed that through executive order all information on Waco will be sealed and will no longer be accessible to anybody. They're talking about putting a 30-year wait on it, just like they did the Kennedy Files. Now, what is it that they did that was so righteous and right that they feel they have to seal it to the general population? Ah. Uh, stupid, stupid man. Yes, what is Technically none, but they had to have rifles, remember that. So while, while assuredly as a sovereign you have rights above and beyond, and in fact, these executive orders which are illegal, uh, if they're issued there, not, they do not technically have authority over us, but we have done this through, through uh, assumption. We've allowed them to take so much that they now have enough weapons, they think, to continue the process to, set, to such an extent that they won't ask us any more questions. They'll simply do what they want. We should understand that if they have their way, the only bottom, the bottom line of this is slavery. Nothing more, nothing less. In other parts of the country, I've met with unit commanders from company strength, battalion strength, brigade strength units. At full strength, these units sometimes are as large as 5,000 men and women. They're fully armed, fully equipped, fully prepared, and they're ready. They're willing to fight. In fact, the biggest problem we've had, and I think this is one of the problems we're seeing right now, people are so energized and know that something is wrong and are so pissed off that they aren't wanting to talk anymore. I mean, I'll tell you what happens, and I haven't had it happen here, thank you. I've been to several different meetings so far where we've had hundreds of people, and it's an eerie thing to stand up here at this end and watch. But at some point during a meeting, somebody will say, Mark, when do we go to war? And again, the whole room is eerie. The whole room is gone silent. As a group, all people take a breath. And everybody turns and looks, and they wait. And you can physically watch the whole group move to the front of their chairs. We all know something's wrong. It is, a, is an involuntary response that I've watched, but I've seen it with tens of thousands of people from all different groups. And even in small groups, in a small room, somebody will step forward or lean forward and say, when do we do this? That's a good question. On the one hand, I think that's why I want everybody to organize at the lowest level. We'll know the time. When Lexington was hit, they took the brunt of a 3,000-man combat force. 18 men stood against a full combat brigade by today's standards. Now, they knew when they stood out on the line that they didn't stand a chance. They were not going to be able to stop the British juggernaut. But because of the 18 men who stood, 10,000 militiamen responded within less than a five or six hour period. And the road back to Boston was littered with the bodies and drenched with the blood of British soldiers who tried to rape a little part of Concord. We will know the time. And the enemy is fearful of that. That's why they know they have to have the weapons first. Even with a pitiful remnant of what we have, we've had in the past, if we stand up, we have it. They know it too. Coin warfare is, is the thing they fear because coin warfare is this. These men over here, six or seven men, are a unit. These six people here are a unit. These six people back here are ten over there. I don't want to know what he's doing. I don't want to know what he's got. I don't want to know where he is, where he lives. These ten men get hit or attacked by, by a, a, an imperial force. We are all committed through our honor to protect these men or this family or these men in the back. And all of us will respond. Whoever gets hit, whoever is attacked, whoever is confronted, 
we will protect those people. Now, that's going to be hard some, for some people to, to digest right away, but I guarantee, and I've seen this, and it's eerie, but I, I was sitting out, in the, out here listening to the speaker earlier, and I was thinking about how, how much of a terror these meetings are to the enemy, even with smaller numbers of people, because they can't stop this. They will have to eventually come out and try to rout us out. And when they do that, we will know the time. Right. Well, I think the next one, for instance, I think would be several different actions. They're primed and ready to go. If they hit us the way they're talking about doing it, don't worry, you'll have plenty of friends and relatives to protect. But like I said before, Mark's gone. Uh, I won't be a mystery death or anything. Uh, I, contrary to popular demand, I'm not dead, as you can see, standing right here. The latest thing came out of the West Coast was that I had been either arrested or was killed again. So I've survived three deaths. I've got, uh, let's see, uh, 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 I've got six more to go. So I'm pretty good Meow. <laughs> but because of that, this type of disinformation is being generated constantly. When uh, I first got involved with this, where I was really public again, what we're doing now, um, first I was a major drug kingpin. That story didn't work. So then I'm a federal agent. I'm waiting for child molestation and tax evasion because those have to come in here sometime, but I haven't seen them yet. I've had two or three people try to play imposter. We've had every every imaginable organization claim that I'm with some other imaginable organization or unimaginable. But in reality, the problem that, that the other side has is that they I'm very overt about it. If somebody tells me something, I'm going to turn around and tell you everything. And that bothers them because you can't blackmail me, you're not going to buy me off, and you can't threaten me. I know for a fact that I'm already marked. You can only kill me once. Yeah. All right. <laughs> but because of that, I have faith that God's going to protect me. I've never been fearful of this, I will say that. And you've got to take the same position. We all have a place in life. You get past, the, past any kind of fear, and you understand that you know, sometime or another I'm going to pass on. The only thing I can do is the best job I possibly can, inform everybody I possibly can, teach my children to the best of my ability with what little time that I always have. And it's really a problem because I do this a lot. And when I'm done, I'll be able to say when I stand before God, and he asks us one question, did you do everything that you thought you possibly could? And I'll be able to stand before anybody, and I'll be able to tell them, absolutely. I've run my life into the ground, but I've done it for a reason, and I'm proud of that. Because I'd like to be able to stand next to this man someday, too. And I know where he is. That impresses me the most. I know, I know as sure as I'm standing here where this man is right now. He is such an inspiration. So I'm only telling you, the, the number one man on the list, as far as this country goes, that man had the opportunity. George Washington could have been emperor. Easily. We could have right back in the same soup we were in before. Half the nation would have followed George Washington anywhere he wanted to go. And the man stepped aside. And he created a tradition which stuck, stuck with this nation for a long period. Now, unfortunately, someone that stepped aside to kind of slide and lose his eye. We need to change that. They don't even have spines anymore. Mark, yes. can you tell us what Bogrites is doing? Right now, Bogrites is doing a radio program out west. We haven't heard any more of them that he was involved with Waco. I was in communication two days ago through another party with him. And we might even do a radio program with him in the next week, but we haven't heard any more from him so far. He does a training program, what type of survival training Right, program. spike program. I'm not trying to be derogatory, but I will say this. Okay, this is something I want to stress with everybody. Guerrilla warfare dictates that anonymity be very, very important. Smallest level, smallest units, no lists. I may bring you all together word of mouth, but I sure as hell don't want to know anything about these people. The only person I want to worry about is this team leader right here when he steps forward, or this team leader here, he has the names, not me. That's right, there's a reason for that. I challenge all of you that if you organize your own militia elements or if you organize as a family, what you do is you look into the eyes of the people that you've lived with all your life. You will know by body, by voice, by reflection, and by mannerism what you're going to get out of that person. 
You're the person, you've lived with that, with that man, you've known that man for years. You will know if you will be betrayed. You will know if you can trust him or her. And that's very important because all I should have to do is come to this man as a household leader and say, do you vouch for the men that are under you? Now you have to decide for yourself whether or not you're going to take the responsibility. Now you have to decide. That's the way the revolution was found. That's how the founding fathers built the armies up. And that is the only way it can be done truthfully because, yes, then you have spies from the outside. We still had betrayals, by the way. People should remember this. Some of the central patriots who were involved who were the loosely knit elements were some of our greatest traitors, <laughs> unfortunately. We had three very big scandals in the first part of the revolution. People who were in the core of the, of the, of the uh, Revolutionary Army, uh, one was a Dr. Walker, were people who were uh, down, tied, you know, tied and true uh, Tories and walked away with everything that they could when they felt that they were compromised. If it can happen to them, it's going to happen to us. But you have to, first of all, decide in your heart of hearts of the people that you're going to work with. What I'm saying right now is what scares the enemy the most. That's why I am hated by a lot of people. Because you have to know first the people that you will trust and work with. Because when the time comes when you're doing this, trust me, you don't want to have to look back and find airspace. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, fellas, they're over here. Okay? That's your biggest concern. That's right. That's right. You've got to make sure that you know the heart of the people that you're with. You will know when you've been betrayed, as I said. You can look into the eye of that person that is, in, that is your responsibility, and you will know. That's the best you can do and the best you can hope for. But you've got to do it at that end first. The old parable and the best parable is to build your house on a foundation of sand or a foundation of stone. We build it on stone with brick. The best bricks that we have are the citizen in his smallest component, knowing the friend that is with him. From there you can build a house anywhere. You see how that works? That's what scares the hell out of the enemy. Something else that somebody said that I really do go along with is the second thing that probably scare more is if we all walked into our living room, grabbed our television, and threw it in the garbage tomorrow. If they found 400,000 televisions in, in the trash tomorrow morning, they'd be so terrified that they wouldn't know what to do. But barring that, since we're getting rid of the televisions, let's go to the next best thing. Let's communicate with each other. Organize. Now, I don't want to keep you a lot longer, but I do want to cover a few other things. Number one, munitions, weapons, food, medical support. All of it will be illegal, but get it now. We're not too worried about later on down the road. Medical support. If any of you people, and i got to stress this now, if any of you have special medication needs, if any of you have heart medication, if there's something that you need now, put some of it away. Under the socialized medicine mechanism, all of that will be gone. We're already starting. That's right. It's already happening. By the way, if you go to your pharmacy and ask, you will find that, that the pharmacy is short Many of the primary medications that would normally be needed, many of the heart medicines are in short supply. There is a reason for that. Five of the major drug companies, who, by the way, are almost all owned by the Rockefeller clan anyway, uh, five of the major industries are experiencing problems in manufacturing right now. Yeah. Now, Eli Lilly just laid off 30,000 people overall in the last four weeks. Um, Warner Lambert, which we're closely associated with in different ways, is in hard times, and in fact has closed down half of its manufacturing, both out of country and in country. All of these major companies are creating hardship in production. But this is ideal if you consider that when you're going to socialized medicine, you want this period when there's a shortage, so when they do take control, the old iron fist takes over. Yeah, we'll give you your heart medication, Mr. Schmidlap, but you have to tell us a few things first. We'd like to know about your name. Oh, and, and, and Mrs. Hornady, uh, yes, you can have your chemotherapy this time. But first, let's have a little discussion. Now, anybody have Walmart near them in the area right now? We're everywhere. Oh, good. Well, go to your Walmart and tell them you want to you get a prescription. You're going to get a form about the size of this. And they're going to also have a little paper about this size about inconvenience. Do you know what that inconvenience is about? The federal government has laid down regulations dictating that if you're to buy any prescription medicine, the company that you buy the prescription medicine from is to collect data on you and put it on a file on a computer base. What type of toothpaste you use, 
what over-the-counter drugs you use, like aspirin, Tylenol, all ibuprofen, all those. What type of other cosmetics you use. What relatives, where are they, who know, you know, the whole nine yards. And this little pamphlet was made to explain about the other papers you get to fill out. Now, is this reminiscent of anything? Oh, well, yes. People should remember that up until oh, about four years ago, there was no problem with any citizen in this country withdrawing money from the bank. Then they passed Appeal 100 690. You can have your money, just fill this form up. Over $3,000? Oh, well, uh, who's with you? What's her name? What are the children's names? Oh, by the way, if you don't answer these questions, we don't give you the money. Because under the law, the way the form's written, you have to identify not only yourself, but any of the parties that are with you. Now, I've got all the federal forms at home. And in fact, if you go to the bank and ask somebody who's a teller, have them bring them home some night and read what they're supposed to write down. What they did is they took the corporate entity and they forced them to become an agent of the government. And now they're spying on you. And how many times have you heard this? Oh, I'm sorry. It, it was my job. I, I had to do it. Well, you mean like the data reader for consumer power? Turns you into the DNR? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. yep. The way things are sitting right now, and Detroit Edison's another one too, by the way. Yeah. Detroit Edison had a series of uh, handouts 1 800 ATF GUNS. Yeah. The one with the eyeball on it? Yep. Yeah. Do you know somebody who owns guns? Yeah. Do you know somebody who's into guns? Yeah, exactly. Call 1-800 and you can have a piece of this property. See? But it's not just guns because now we're going to have the eco not the, the eco tariffs, which are you, is anybody who uses gasoline, anybody who uses lead, anybody who has gardening implements, because after all, just like in the end of 19, uh, in 1947, when Orwell wrote his book 1984, the Fabians took over British, uh, uh, the British government after World War II, right at the end of World War II. George Bush is a Fabian, a Fabian socialist. Bill Clinton is a Fabian socialist. I've said this before, but I'll kind of balance it out and do it for you again, because this is the best part about it. We've got a nice group of people here. Tell me what symbol comes to mind when we talk government mechanisms. Communism. Hammer and sickle, right? Fascism. Okay. Socialism. Well, that's close, but you don't have one, do you? Now, I'm talking about national symbol. Think about it. What they did was this. On the one hand, on one side, we're supposed to have the evil rightist, fascism, right, with a swastika. A symbol. You have to have a symbol. You know, an idiot symbol, like crossing the street. You know, walk, don't walk, is not there anymore. Oh, they got with a line? Okay. And then they got a hand with a line through it. It's called foster. That's right. The swastika on this side is supposed to be right wing. Hammer and sickle is left wing. It's the difference between the two. They're both tyrannical governments in theory. They both have centralized governments, and they should also they all, they all be on the right. But think about it. With this litmus, it's an all-socialist mechanism. It's national socialism, social communism. I'll ask you again. Socialism. Does anybody know which socialism we're talking about? Well, yes, it is, but there's a term for it. Fabian socialism. The Fabian Party's motto is, make haste slowly and strike with extreme terror, the iron fist. Their symbol was a tortoise. Usually on every campus, and this one may have one also, on this campus somewhere, if they're already here, it's a stone about so big with a turtle symbol in line, cut into stone, usually into green, I think it's green granite. It's laid in the property somewhere, usually stuck in a little park or a little area that's on here to signify that the Fabians have taken this campus, usually taken the libraries. Uh, before George Orwell wrote his book, he was a Fabian socialist. Well, the Fabians took over England in 1945, and from 1945 to 1947, they had constant starvation. Now, they were, you always see these newsreels done by the other socialists in this country that, oh, it was a war and they didn't have production. Bullshit. What it is, they had what they call the tomato police. And there's no joke to this. What they did is, well, like mom here or dad would say, well, uh, 
since we can't buy food, we'll make food. And we'll grow it in our backyard. And these people could grow stuff in their little gardens just like they've always done. Window boxes. Yes, in window boxes. You could feed a country in window boxes if you have to. Well, guess what? You had the tomato police. Under Fabian socialism, you were allowed four tomato plants per family. The neighbor next door only had his four. In fact, maybe he didn't plan any at all because he's a good party member, so he figured he was gonna get a he was gonna get a boost in social status by being a good party member, okay? But you planted eight tomato plants. Four of them couldn't be seen by the road by the inspector. So I get on the telly and tell them all about the tomato plants. There's four of them in the backyard. Do I get my extra loaf of bread? Good puppy, you do get your extra loaf of bread. And the tomato police showed up and would destroy all the plants that were extra. In less than two years, England was starving. People in England were going to Ireland, you know, all the places of the potato famine. They were going to Ireland to eat because you couldn't buy food in England. Now think about that. Ireland is dirt poor. I mean, we're talking dirt poor. That's where the term came from. Because they have rock for real estate. And they turned around and they went there, and of course there's a little joke about the Irish the Irish about the Irish the Irish waiter feeding the little kids, giving them food, and he would joke, Oh, oh the little ones seem a little thin. How about a few more potatoes? <laughs> and they'd laugh. There's a reason they laugh, because it was a classic joke for the Irish. They'd been suffering for years. And here were the English now under the same rule, being treated the exact same way. Is history repeating itself? Oh well, yes, because watch and see if you can get this health care through. Next comes controlling the food. Because after all, aren't they already saying that the reason that you're sick is because you're just not eating right? The only next logical step, if I can tell you what to smoke, what to drink, what to do, is to tell you what to eat. And the party doesn't like you eating as well as you are right now. Yes? Are they using the National Guard helicopters like they just did in our county, the 30th and the 29th of August, to spot marijuana plant? Are they using that as practice for the food plant? Surveying food sites, the same technology would be used because what that is is part of the Earth's system. Yeah. Earth was originally developed at the University of Michigan and has to do with infrared scan surveillance. Originally, it was off time by 24 hours. It took that long to interpret the film. Now they have on-time yeah. delivery. As soon as they see what, what's on the screen, they can interpret what it is. They can adjust the technology to whatever type of plant or life form they wish to, wish to monitor. So yes, the technology is already there. Just a flick of the switch and identify this plant. Now consider this too. A lot of our food, if you couldn't find grow it, say out in the open and do your regular tilling, aren't you at least going to try to covertly grow food to make sure that your family doesn't starve? Now this comes to something we've talked about for years, that if you are a farmer, and you have some periphery land that's kind of iffy, I recommend planting a lot of things that are conducive to good health, like berry bushes, fruit trees that go wild, things that will look natural and be there for years. This stuff should be planted all over. Uh, Jerusalem artichokes are a good choice. Cattails are a consumable good, but oh, oh, if you pick cattails, what are you now? An environmental eco-terrorist, because cattails are in it. Cattails are now on the, endangered, on, the, on, the, on the protected list. So if, if you have cattails in your yard and somebody can see you picking them, I can call next door and have your house in three days. Because we'll have an eco-terrorist raid. We'll even show the, the dead buds, the old dead stalks, and the eviscerated scalped bodies. And they'll carry each stalk out one at a time so the camera can see it. <laughs> yeah. About a month ago at Baltimore, which is right on 94, I was going by there one day a state police posted. There were two of the big helicopters there. So I went back and made a couple of passes by, you know, just to see what I could see. They also had a, one of these big fuel trucks, you know, National Guard or Army fuel truck, a huge tank on it. So they've been there a while and they were working from that site and uh, at, the, at the police that's one of their missions, but those are only a small percentage of the helicopters available. And the mission is not even a priority right now. It was an army helicopter. Yeah. Painted dark green. That's in fact um, at least two other people in the last two meetings in the last four days 
uh, have had different sightings of that type in different area, different communities all through the area where different helicopters were landing in sets. At the one uh, local police department, I think in Romulus, they called up and asked, a woman passed by the department, called up and asked and said, uh, who owns those two helicopters uh, you guys got there? And the duty sergeant said, what helicopters? Now the two helicopters parked next to your building, you stupid idiot. <laughs> of course, then he hung up. So they, a lot of them, first of all, they don't want to admit to the mission. And in most cases, again, the same problem we have with this, which kind of goes back to markings. Now, some people have been trying to explain that, well, they have markings on them. Yes, they do. Black on black does not constitute identifiable markings that you can easily recognize so that you can report aircraft violations. And if you don't think it's crucial, go out to your private airplane if you have one next time and paint them over white and see how long it takes for federal aviation officials to show up and visit and talk to you. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Yeah, here, uh, three weeks ago, I seen a couple of helicopters set down at our municipal airport here in Mount Pleasant. And uh, I'm only a mile from it. So I went over there and it was four, it was four other, it was six bullets. Beirut city-state, 
Syria taking most of the central and northern part of Lebanon, and the Israelis getting the rest of what is the West Bank and exterminating their Palestinian threat. Because they'll destroy the consolidated forces that the PLO or that the Palestinians have. There's a big difference between those two words. Many Palestinians are Falange Christian, not Muslim. During the infanticide that was taking place, the Falange Christian store owners were the ones who were being attacked, not the Muslims. And there's a reason to get rid of the Christian population that is in the region. May I remind everybody here about desert dust. The two largest Christian populations in the Middle East that mean anything are in two locations where we've had some of the bloodiest conflicts. Number one, Lebanon, which for a period of time was actually Christian run, if you recall. In fact, for the first time in history, Lebanon became a Christian state, predominantly a Christian-run government. It had some coalition members who were Muslim. The other population group is where? Iraq. Iraq. That's the second largest Christian population in the Middle East. We've had major conflicts and wars in both of them. In each case, kind of like what happened with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know, the two Japanese cities were the two largest Christian populations in them. These areas are being harvested before any real actions take place. They're ensuring that the Christian threat or that the Christian threat across the globe is systematically eliminated in some way. Who they are, I'll put a question mark next to that because the CFR isn't the only game in town. There are many other players here. But the reality is you have to look at patterns. Now during the Desert Storm, and this is why I say Syria, I brought Syria into the picture, nobody's talking about it. During Desert Storm, the great threat in the area was not Iraq, it was Syria. Syria had as many Russian troops as Iraq. Syria has the SS-21, by the way. I'm sorry, the, S yeah, the SS-20. The SS-20 are the first two stages of the SS-18 intercontinental ballistic missile, capable of reaching anywhere on the globe. We know that they have 27 launchers plus, and that is an intercontinental missile, capable of reaching anywhere on the planet. Now, who is still in charge and who still has an untouched military base? Syria. It's a little long range to be used against Israel, but it's a nice, a nice weapon to be dumped on us or on the European theater to create some confusion there. So Syria, obviously, is still in their pay if you look at the way they're puppeteering the globe. They'll soon be brushed aside, too, just like Iraq was. Iraq was given the opportunity. They, uh, the only reason Saddam's alive, I will say this, is because he knew how to play the game. He had enough papers, documents that were in English, and enough blackmail material to keep himself alive. That's why we could not invade Iraq, by the way. The reason we did not invade Iraq is because Saddam had photocopy machines, too. And if they'd gone into Iraq with 400,000 good English-speaking American citizens, we have a tendency to walk in, look at stuff, and go, yeah, that's nice. And it comes home like that. Isn't that what happened in World War II? Isn't that what happens in Korea? And we were carrying shit like, excuse me, but we were carrying weapons of destruction home. Uh, mortars, rocket launchers, artillery pieces in some cases. If it wasn't nailed down, it got sent back to the United States. We had too many documents. So for the last couple of years, they've been sending United Nations, probably CIA and KGB spies in as observation teams to collect as much of the real data as they could to make it disappear. Their objective is to make sure that Saddam's insurance policies are destroyed systematically one at a time so they can't be observed. Because he still has enough physical evidence that he can still keep himself alive. Otherwise, he'd be dead in a heartbeat. I don't care what anybody says. He, they are willing to amputate an arm to save a body. In other words, if need be, and as in our case, we have to be very careful. That's why we have to use coin warfare here. If they perceive that we are going to retake the Republic, they would rather kill a good portion of us in a firestorm than worry about us regaining this piece of real estate. So we have to be very cautious. Everything must be balanced and timed accordingly. Remember that. They've never been this close. I've talked about this analogy. It's just like a kid going around the merry-go-round time and time again. Remember those golden rings? If you got them, you either got to keep the ring or you got a special prize. Well, they've gone around at least twice in this last two decades and they've almost caught the ring and they've almost won. But never before have they gotten their fingers inside the brain. And not only that, they can feel the tug because they're starting to pull. They've almost got it in their hands. If they succeed in this, whoever 
destroys the United States Constitution goes down in history as their greatest member. Think about that. That's why it behooves Mr. Clinton, because he does have a puffed up, puffed up ego, okay? It behooves Mr. Clinton, a la Emperor Blight, to try in some way implement their plans. If he does it, he will be remembered in their annals forever. For he will have accomplished what many have tried but never been able to finish. We've got to make sure that doesn't happen. I don't think we have any problem with that either. And I know we'll succeed. On the global picture, understand this too, for instance, since we're looking at little global problems here now. Uh, every English-speaking nation of the globe right now has passed major gun confiscation laws in the last two years. Australia, New Zealand, England, and Canada. Only one of them have not succeeded so far here. It was supposed to be done two years ago, and it hasn't been. Because of that, we're in good shape. So, what are we going to do? Well, like I said, we're going to kick them back off into the oceans, drive them overseas, and we're going to take this piece of real estate, make it in the finest nation we could possible. Yes? Yeah, are, are you going to give us any updates that you might have on this number here and things like that? Okay, uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana is the most important because it implements thousands of personnel. What it does is moves in anywhere from two to five brigades that have strength probably of about three to four thousand. They're also rotating in the United Nations troops immediately. That was announced publicly. And by the way, there were four points that they wanted to emphasize for training at Fort Polk. The most important was item D. Item D was to take what the United Nations had learned in Somalia, uh-oh, what did they learn in Somalia? House to house search and seizure, control of large groups of people, and confiscation of firearms. And who was doing it? American troops. Well, they want to take what they learned in Somalia and train the forces here so that they can use it here. And they said that publicly. I've got, I've got a little note in the briefcase, in the briefcase. I think I can find it. And I, I have also the name of the commanding general, but it's not on the top of my head. The general that's in charge, of course, is a CFR member, by the way. He was trained by the CFR probably four years ago. He's a flag officer. He's a brigadier, I believe. Uh, at Fort Dix, which is being checked out this weekend by another group of people, we have new photographs. Uh, Fort Dix has a very interesting situation. We know that they're occupied. Bush publicly announced its occupation. In the motor pool, on one side, we have Chevy Cut Beats. The cut B is a, is a Chevy pickup truck with a diesel engine. In Woodland, camouflage looking like all of our military trucks. On the other side of this compound, and this is again a real compound, there are a series of the same cut B trucks, but they're all powder blue. They have no government stamps on them anywhere, not on the bumpers, not on the side doors, and that is not typical for military garrison vehicles that are US owned, nor is it typical for prison vehicles. In all cases, they first must identify the agency, and then they must also notify that this vehicle is for official use only. Nothing is on any of the vehicles that are in the motor pool. Also, the backs of the trucks have a very interesting configuration. They have an oversized canvas cover that drapes over the wheel wells, and obviously can be extended so that you can increase the storage capacity in the back of the truck. In addition to that, there are five to seven Bluebird buses that have been painted powder blue with white trim. They have no markings on the bumpers. They have no markings on the doors. But all of the glass has been made uh, smoke. You can't see through the vehicle, and you can't see into the vehicle <coughs> if anybody's in there. And in fact, in the photographs that we have that are still already, the pictures that we have are of the vehicle being boarded by military personnel. And the driver's windows are also smoked over, which is not characteristic considering most state laws restrict the smoking or the restriction of visibility for the driver's front panels. So again, this is not characteristic, but it is on site already. We know that an American prison and an international prison are now in place at Fort Dix. Both of them run by the United Nations. One is for American prisoners, as originally described by George Bush. The other one is an international prison facility. So there's a combination. In addition to this, there are several other garrison elements that are moving in. 
We do know that in Texas, for instance, Gurkha personnel, contrary to some of this other disinformation, that Gurkha personnel are participating in strengthening internal security actions. In Texas, you have many internal security checkpoints for Border Patrol. The Gurkhas, which are Nepalese, are trained mercenaries. The Nepalese government receives money for every Nepalese national that serves with the British military forces. No other country employs these people as mercenaries. And yet at this time, there are a large number of them inside the United States. They're not Cambodian, they're not Balkan, they're not Indonesian. Uh, there are two other garrison sites, one in Galveston, which is being checked out this weekend also. We have people down there. The Galveston site is capable of housing approximately 24,000 personnel. The original report came from, a na from naval aviators who are stationed across from this site and who have stated uncategorically that the site is limited access, no U.S. personnel across the wire, and the entire compound is restricted for the personnel that are inside. So what we have is a probably a Class A facility similar to the one in Indianapolis. The Indianapolis site is improving. Since last I spoke to Linda Thompson, she is now in contact with an individual out of Texas who tapped into the satellite relays during the Waco siege. Now he has an extensive amount of footage on the Waco attack, the final one, in which he has several hours of multiple views from the different cameras as they were feeding by satellite to New York. So the cameras continued to run. They did not shift. The cameras continued to run. They shifted to other cameras instead. Yes? Are you going to get a tape on that? Yes, we are. Uh, Linda's, that's the next tape that Linda will produce, as we said. Yes? I'm getting ready to take off. I'm going to be taking over the meetings. And so starting October 9th, the next meeting will be at the library. And if I can get everything put together, I'm going to have these guys back at our next meeting. I won't know until the middle of this week. If not, we will for sure have them back on the 1st of December or in the first two weeks of December whenever I can get it scheduled. As far as I know, I don't think we're going to do anything for uh, November because it's deer season and it interferes with things. But if I can, I'll get something set up either towards the end or at the very first. So meeting at the library on the second Saturday of October. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's OK. Uh, an interesting point, which was reminded by looking down at the pictures in front of me, uh, concerning the sign markers, we're not just looking for geometric symbols. Some of these sign markers are also have, have cookie cutter numerical symbols. One, two, three, four, five, six, in red, blue, or green. However, if there is a base color, red, blue, or green, uh, rectangular sticker, you'll find a different color for the numerical uh, attachment that's above it. Now, what we think that is, is again a root designation, but then a priority control number for each of the roots. From one through six, each one progressively may have lesser importance. Priority one on down. By the way, I should pass these around so you know if these are color photos. These are color photocopies. But that's another reminder. Oh, have you ever seen a an Air Force uh, train, engine, powder blue? No. Neither have I, but there's one in here. There we go. There was a question. Yes. Um, real quick, on the stickers that are being put on the back of the sign, are they basically significantly major roads? They are, they were, they were not operational on any of the expressways. They were on state highways only. However, since the beginning or the beginning of the middle of this week, two interstate highways have been marked. Now we do want people to watch for one thing that we have spotted. On the back of some signs in some areas, we don't know why it's key, but it does mark a special area, you will find instead of the small patches, large reflective white X's on the back of the signs. Now they are from one point to another. And in that, they have other white markers, like it's a denoted target area or it's, it's a special zone. And then they proceed with the other markers again, greens, reds, blues, whatever. We want to try and identify what may be to the size of those that may require using flat maps or, ge or geological survey maps to determine what's going on. Now, OK, just a minute. Right ahead. We, we had this auditorium from 9 until 5. Oh. <laughs> we just got that boot. So 
just, just take a couple of minutes and just wind her down. Okay, we'll wrap it up. We so, if there are any questions, contact me. Uh, I'll give out my telephone number to individuals here, although we're getting a lot of calls. If something that is a priority comes up, please communicate with either people inside the organization here or communicate with me directly. There are other party people that you can talk to with different entities that are out here that can relay the information. It is important that we collect data. One of the things that a lot of these quote unquote professionals don't like right now is the fact that we're turning everybody into an intelligence collection agency. That means that it's not all that marketable, but the information gets out faster. My concern is informing people, or at least getting everybody to participate. In doing that, you will do more damage than anything else you possibly could to affect a turnaround on this. Now again, all we're doing is throwing up stumbling blocks. Do I think they're going to try and pull this off quickly? Yes, indeed. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, it, I'll tell you what, these next three weeks are going to be crucial. I would say that beyond any other time that we probably lived in, we are sitting on the edge of probably one of the worst storms this country's ever seen. And the reason I say that is because, as, as before, they are finished with their bickering in Washington. When they're done, they were going to come out like locusts and they're not going to eat our lunch. They're finished with all the petty positions, they've, they've assigned everybody they need. Remember again, as I said, God bless the Republic, death the New World Order, we shall prevail. Come on. Uh, if you were in the audience last night, you'll know something of my background. I have spoken to audiences across the world and across the United States.